Today's guest is Jenny Jablonski. In 2012, she suffered a near-death experience with fentanyl, a prescription opioid medication that caused her lungs to stop working. After this event, she began to see, sense, and feel energies in a very dramatic ways that she had no previous context for, and we are going to find out about them. Jenny, thank you so much for giving me some of your time this evening. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for what you're doing. Mm. All right. Can we just start with a little bit of your background and can you tell us about your NDEs? Sure. Um, I did have an NDE when I was three months old. I did not remember it until after my second NDE. And I basically was three months old. I had whooping cough. I was in the hospital, packed in ice in a tent. I had turned blue. It looked very grim. And uh, I did not realize again until, you know, quite recently, a few years ago, that I did pass to the other side. Okay. And um, I said, you know, please don't make me go back. I, this is not what I expected. I, I'm pretty sure I was a little bit surprised at um, what I was being invited into, the life I was being invited into. And I asked to stay on the other side. And I was told, that I had to return. And I fought back and forth a few times and eventually came back. And uh, because of that, there was quite a bit of anger in my energy field from from that experience and um, certainly made sense uh, in the past few years in healing that and um, finding the trapped emotions and the judgment from that event and more specifically anger at God. It's interesting that you said that. Do you feel like that you were an angry child? And was that because of that um, experience? I've never been told that. I don't think I was an angry child, but I feel that I had that vibration inside of me and that the climate that I was bought, brought up in, my my family experience, um, was fed was probably most likely fed by that Mm. and when we you know there are a lot of metaphysical people who will say like attracts like if you have a low vibration you'll attract low vibration events into your life and it's quite possible that because i had that anger vibration within my body and my mind uh, that i may have attracted some things to me into my life experience that might not have happened. Mm. When did you finally release that vibration? Well, it's a process, you know, I'm 54 years old. (laughs) So there's a lot of events to unpack. Mm. Uh, It's, um, it's not something that just anyone, I think at any moment can say, you know, I'm going to magically heal right now. Uh, relieve myself of all lower vibration frequency, you know, thoughts, feelings, or emotions, especially people that have experienced significant trauma and traumatic events in their life. Mm. It's a bit of a journey and I'm still doing it. Mm. Um, I use a lot of uh, Sylvan mind control, you know, Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, alpha, theta, gamma brainwave techniques it, in my work for myself. And, and I suggest that work for my clients as well to help us release these types of thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Mm, that's interesting. You know, it's so funny is I forgot about the Silva method. I think they used to advertise that back on TV back in the day. Yes. We're both about the it same should, age because I was going to say that may be right. dating us. <laughs> well, Mind Valley has um, brought that forward again. And uh, obviously, Dr. Joe Dispenza's work, although his was born out of physically healing himself, there's still a, a large component of addressing our, our thoughts and our patterns and our programs from our childhood and early adulthood. Mm. Okay. It's very effective. I, I highly recommend it if, you know, we, there are so many people who want to heal themselves and can't afford these days to go, you know, twice a month or even once a month to some type of alternative healer. Mm-hmm. And this is a very effective way to go into your own I think subconscious is maybe not complete enough, but into your own unconscious patterns Mm -hmm. 
and and find them on on your own. I certainly don't um, suggest trying it without some sort of professional advice, psychiatric support, therapeutic environment, especially mm-hmm. if you have been diagnosed with a mental illness or have really suffered a lot of trauma. Um, but for those who who just really don't either trust people, which I've met a lot of people, in, you know, in that boat, mm-hmm. or who just don't have the money for constant, you know, therapeutic environments or alternative healing environments, it is a very effective way to heal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that um, you're right about Dr. Joe Dispenza, because I think he has a lot of good stuff out there. And I really like what he talks about mm-hmm. the neuroplasticity. Yes. Kind of just absolutely, it. and I see people change every day in in my work. Mm. You know, you if you allow yourself to be open to waking up tomorrow and feeling differently and reacting differently and mm. thinking differently, mm. it can be done. It makes me kind of think about people who have suffered in DEs. I don't know if "suffer" is the right word. Who's had the experience? It seems like a lot of people have a lot of after effects from them and they have to manage that. Is that true? And would this stuff that we are talking about be helpful for them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, Not only after effects, but I've seen many scientific studies and a lot of researchers. And I know that you recently had a a guest, PMH Atwater, who I think she may have interviewed 10,000 people over her career who've had NDEs. Mm. And um, there are several other people who are doing that research as well. There are um, a number of theories as to whether or not people that have experienced NDEs have all or some of the preponderance of been experienced some trauma in their life. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different scientific theories floating around. And, you know, if you're really interested in the subject, you can find just about any opinion, mm-hmm. but the after effects also um, are are very varied. Um, some people find it difficult to come back into the same lifestyle because their perspective and their empathy for other people is so significantly altered. Some people come back with gifts and abilities. Some people come back, like myself, with abilities, but with a lot of data flow, a lot of information, just as if we were talking on the phone to the other side, but they never hung up the mm-hmm. receiver, mm-hmm. you know, in yeah. old fashioned telephone terms, right? right. We, the, the receiver is just lying on the counter. Nobody ever disconnected the line. Yeah. And, um, Many other, I mean, people do struggle. They struggle because it um, it challenges their the faith that they had previously been so devout to. Mm. It challenges the belief systems of people in their family or their friends or their colleagues. A lot of people who have NDEs go through a tremendous life transformation. You're absolutely correct. Mm. I post my videos in a few Facebook groups that are NDE related. And as I look in these groups, I believe that there are a lot of people in these groups that have them, but they kind of will mention them in comments and stuff. And I think, but I don't think they've ever publicly been on a platform like this. If you could give any advice to anybody who's had an NDE and maybe suffering with after effects or just, you know, trying to sort out their life, what kind of advice would you give? Wow, I don't think I've ever been asked that before. Well, first I would say, first I would say that it's real. And I love hearing the stories from people that say, I'm 65 years old and I had an NDE when I was 13 and I've never talked about it until now. And some of these NDEs are the most beautiful, most profound stories that I've ever read. Just phenomenal. And they've been afraid to come forward, afraid to share their story. And I, I don't think that there is that much pushback today for people in sharing their stories. Now, certainly, if it pushes your comfort zone or it comes up against the belief system of a spouse 
or you're or you're very young and your livelihood is dependent upon your parents and you must stay silent. I, I certainly respect that. I certainly understand that. But in the community, you can find people like myself and many other people who do support people in different ways who have suffered NDEs. And there are certainly many um, retired now medical doctors, emergency room physicians, psychiatrists, psychotherapists who do work with people. Um, there are mediums, some of whom you've had on your show, and intuitives such as myself. Now, some of the people who support people with NDEs really are married to science and medicine and will only speak in terms of the five sensory reality around us for support. So if someone is really open to esoteric conversations or their NDE followed a life of sensitivity and intuition, in other words, they were born with these abilities as, as I was, but I shut them down when I was younger and many, many people have, then it may be better to either do both or choose an intuitive where you will be validated, where you will feel validated. On my journey, I, I was so naive and I had never heard any of the terminology. I had, didn't know what an NDE was. I didn't know what spirituality. I literally had never heard the term spirituality. I was raised Methodist, but mm -hmm. I didn't know about metaphysics, never heard of Hinduism, Buddhism. I mean, I'm sure I passed a statue of Buddha somewhere, but I, I just was very sheltered. I grew up in Pennsylvania and went straight to work right out of high school. Mm. So I didn't have anybody encouraging me to expand my horizons or immerse myself in culture or history or spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I think there are many people who have had these experiences who had a very, let's say, sheltered or limited uh, you know, life experience. And mm. ca it can be scary. And it can also be exciting. And there are people, you know, like myself, I can see spirit, I can see energy, I can see energetic cords in between people, I can see the nervous system, the chakras, you know, uh, uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just suggest trying to find someone, a support group, reach out to someone to, to ensure that you feel validated that you know that there are people out there who who you who believe you and who you can talk to and would be willing to support you. Yeah, I think that's great. I find it interesting that twice you mentioned spouse and then you mentioned empathy because last night I had a podcast with PMH and I think she had a stat and it was something like 70% of people who had NDEs get divorced. It was somewhere in the 70s. Yes. And also, I think the way she put it was when they come back and you used it again, you said empathetic, like they're just so almost too nice to everybody. Can you right. comment on that? Well, our senses, our empathy, our compassion, our heart uh, for some of us can be just blasted wide open for lack of a more eloquent explanation. And, and so you do tend to see everyone or some of us can tend to see everyone as a divine spiritual being having a human experience, not a, a wayward human who is displeasing God. Because when you get to the other side, no matter what your chosen religion, no matter what your preferred deity we all see what we expect to see on the other side. I was brought up Methodist. So when I went to the other side, Jesus was there, made sense to me. Well, if a person who really respected Buddhism or studied Buddhism went to the other side, they might see Buddha or a, a Buddhist deity or a beloved teacher, a, a, a Rinpoche, a, a Swami, if you were a Hindu or Sikh or... Um, or Baha'i, or if you were in the Kabbalah, if you uh, were Jewish, you might see your rabbi mm. or a Jewish figure. Mm. 
from the Bible. Mm. So I think that when we come back, most of us, most of us come back with a sense that, oh my gosh, it really is real. It, there really are um, <clears throat> beings on the other side. We really can see our family on the other side. We really don't get judged unless we judge ourselves. You know, um, a lot of people come back with very, you know, firm messages that, you know, hell does not exist. But certainly if our if in our mind we believe that we deserve to go to hell, you know, the universe or whomever will certainly create that for us mm -hmm. if that's what we believe we deserve to experience. Mm -hmm. And any moment we can snap ourselves out of it for the most part. Mm -hmm. And with respect to to divorce, absolutely. I have met so many people whose marriages did not withstand. And I think the most famous ex example is Dr. Eben Alexander. Oh, wow. The neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he was a he was a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. And he lost his family. Yeah, oh, I don't wow. want to speak for him. But I That's can imagine that was quite difficult because his colleagues did not believe him. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I don't know a lot. I know of his story. I don't, I've never interviewed him. I'd love to interview him. Um, and I don't know, I don't know any of those details like that. So that's interesting that, that you said that. Mm -hmm. Oh, he wrote a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you might be interested to read his, his first book was just phenomenal. Yeah. I think I've seen him. I was very him. lucky. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was, was going to say, I think I've seen him interviewed about his book. And that's kind of how I found out about him. Right. Yeah. I myself was very lucky that my husband stood by me. Yeah, that's great. I was going to say that you've, you've got, you, you figured it out somehow or lucky yeah, with your husband because you are still married. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I majored in economics and mm -hmm. my husband majored. He has two degrees. He went to Caltech and UCLA he has two degrees, one in electrical engineering and one in computer science. Mm -hmm. And he thought I was crazy, mm -hmm. but he loved me enough to um, humor me and allow me to go to these silly classes and travel. And, mm -hmm. you know, at the time, right afterwards, I still didn't drive a car after my NDE. And so mm -hmm. he drove me a couple of hours to go meditate with a spiritual group and he would mm -hmm. wait in the car and then he would drive me home a couple of hours. So oh, he indulged me quite a bit. And he said, I just want you to live. So let's just do whatever you need to do. Wow. That is true love. Yeah, I think so. I do. <laughs> and uh, over this decade, he, he has uh, really supported me on this incredibly circuitous journey that I've taken. That's for sure. Now, has he come around over the time and now he believes everything that happened to you? Well, yes. And I, I think he had to for two reasons. One is I was almost talking to people on the phone all the time. Mm -hmm. I always was talking to somebody on the phone and I, they were on the speaker phone and he would constantly hear the people on the speaker phone say, oh, you know, yes, that's correct. How did you know that? Oh my gosh. You know, the pain in my knee is gone ever since I talked to you last week, or yes, that's exactly my dog's experience. Or, oh, I can imagine that my horse would say that that's my horse's personality, or that's exactly how my cat acts, or, you know, all of the feedback that I would get from people. And he said, people have asked him, what do you think about this? Don't you think this is crazy? And he goes, I've heard too much positive feedback mm. that it's undeniable. Mm. And then after a while, as I was doing my healing, I would share with him little intentions or, you know, when I would clear our house of energy or clear myself, I would say, Hey, would you do this with me? Or, you know, I'm clearing this from my life experience. If that, if you had that same energetic imprint in your field, would you want to let that go? And he would say, well, yeah, of course mm. I would, you know, and um, pretty soon he started changing too. Oh. And then one day he was outside with the horses and he came in and he goes, Ginny, I think I heard the horse talk to me. Wow. And he explained he was putting some hoof dressing on one of our horses and the, and the horse was picking up his foot and wouldn't let him uh, put the, apply the dressing to the hoof. And my husband got frustrated. And in his mind, he said, why won't you just stand still? And the horse replied, I don't like this. It makes me slow. Oh. 
Oh, well, wow. the hoof dressing is kind of, I'm sure you've never put nail polish on your fingernails, but all the ladies out there will know that when you put a clear coat or base coat on your fingernails, it sort of tightens them up. Well, that type of dressing on the hoof wall of, of the horse's hoof tightens that hoof wall. Hmm. And when a horse runs, there is an expansion and contraction of the hoof. And that's also one of the reasons they call, they say that a horse has five hearts four feet and one heart because the, the feet pump the blood help assist in pumping the blood from the bottom of the legs back up. Mm. And so of course our horse was a little bit wild and really loved to run. And so he said, it makes me slow. It makes me feel slow. Wow. That's amazing. So, Speaking mm -hmm. of these abilities, you kind of mentioned some, and I think you got them out of your, after your 2012 NDE, I think that was 2012. Can you tell me mm -hmm. about all the abilities that you had access? Came back, right? Came, came back, back with, with right. yeah. Um, well, they've they have grown over time, and so my abilities today are quite different, and and I'm able to manage them better and have boundaries around them better than I did then. But immediately, I literally could hear people's thoughts. I could hear animals talk. I could see dead people. And if I couldn't see them, I knew they were there because I could feel them energetically and I could hear them talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, I knew things I shouldn't know. And it was all quite crazy making. When that first started happening, I mean, how did you deal with that? Well, like a lot of people that have NDEs, I, I went on a, a journey of, you know, why did this happen to me? And, and what does this all mean? And I never heard about energy work or anything. So right away, I started praying a lot, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> you know, makes sense. Yeah. And, and, um, and I went in search of people who could explain to me what I was seeing, sensing and feeling because it was not limited to our five senses. I knew things. I could feel people's emotions. I could feel people's pain. I could hear people talking that weren't in the room. And um, sometimes I would smell like a cigar or a certain, um, um, sometimes I would smell marijuana or, mm. you know, and there's nobody around <laughs> smoking marijuana. And, um, and from time to time I would be in someone's home and I say, is, you know, someone smoking cigarette. And I, you know, someone would say, no, but my grandmother used to, is she mm. here now? Mm. And I would, I would ask, and sure enough, their grandmother was there. Mm. So sometimes it's, it's a way of saying hello, getting your attention. And sometimes you can smell a certain perfume. You know, I've had someone that I was in the same room with get really upset because they thought they smelled their grandmother's perfume and it, it made them very sad. And they said, Kim, come here, can you smell this? And I went over to where they were sitting and sure enough, I did smell a perfume. Mm. It was really lovely. Mm. And she was just beside herself. So mm. does it happen to you even when you don't want to, or do you turn it on and turn it off? Well, now about 95 or more percent of the time, I, I'm able to control it. And unless there's really something my guides or my higher self really want me to know that I don't realize I need to know or need to be aware of, then I will be made aware of something and I'll ask why, because I have boundaries that mm -hmm. I only want to know something if it's helpful for someone. I don't want to be entertained. I don't want to know random information. I don't want to know things about you that would embarrass you mm -hmm. or me, right? If it is helpful and if it can help someone heal and it has to do with bringing a loving message that is capable of being received by the person. In other words, I don't want to be sent to give a message to someone who, you know, might swear at me or not believe me. You know, from time to time, I do get messages on Facebook from people that say, you know, I was brought up in a fundamental household and I don't believe the things you say. And I just respond, well, you know, thank you for thinking of me. And I'm probably the wrong person to discuss this with, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first came back, that wasn't the case. I didn't, I didn't know how to create boundaries because mm -hmm. I didn't understand what was happening to me. Sure. And I didn't know what it all meant. So I had to go on an exploratory journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it really was um, overwhelming in the beginning. And, but I knew I wasn't crazy. 
I knew I just had to figure it out. There was some part of me and I would say, you know, my higher self had a lot of experience in past lives being a, a shaman or shamanic practitioner, being a, um, you know, a, a wise person, an elder and, you know, a wise ancestor. And so I had a bit of stability and a bit of guidance that was the undercurrent of everything that was happening to me. There was a purpose for every experience I had, every teacher I met, whether they liked me or not, whether they invalidated me or they uplifted me, there was a real specific reason why I had to either meet these people or have those experiences. And that is what led me to developing boundaries and developing, you know, an ethical practice. What do you think is the most important thing that you've learned on your journey? The most important thing I think we already touched on, and Mm. that is if it's possible for people to try to take that, what I call the 60,000 foot perspective, Mm. uh, there's a picture behind you of the earth. So imagine Mm. that we're floating in space above the earth and every human being on earth is just like you, a divine being who agreed to embody a human physical form having right now what everyone would consider to be a very challenging experience. And if we can all perceive one another in that way, then we can have much more compassion and much more empathy for one another. And on my journey, I heard a dozen times a day, and I still hear it from time to time, forgiveness is the key, love is the answer. Mm. So if we can bring ourselves to forgive, knowing that forgiveness is for ourself, forgiveness is about personal empowerment, about taking our power back. Once we can forgive others as well as ourselves, we will be able to activate our heart chakra. Mm -hmm. When we're holding so much unforgiveness for other people and blaming other people and swimming around in certain archetypes such as, um, you know, wounded healer or wounded child or um, martyr type of victim archetype, that prevents us from fully expressing our heart and our love and allowing, for example, you to perceive the love of my heart, which some people call affinity, your, our affinity for one another, our oneness, that we are one. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And what that does, whether it's guilt, grief, shame, blame, greed, envy, anger, frustration, it prevents us from fully honoring one another. Mm. So I think that's probably the most important thing that I've learned Mm. is to perceive us all as just really doing the best we can and trying to honor each of our choices. Yeah. I guess we just get caught up in our emotions and our own stuff so much that we forget about everybody else is also on the same ride. That's exactly correct. And when we do have that frenetic energy, Mm -hmm. when we are everything, we're being triggered from a place of fear, it's very, very hard to hear our guides. And so a lot of people say, well, I never hear my guides. I never get guidance the way you do. And and it it's because we have energy stuck in our energy field. We have emotions, we have judged the experiences and that trauma, that stuck energy gets in the way of our psychic abilities and really being able to hear our guides. Can you tell me a little bit more about you being a shaman, like how you got into that and what is there a certain type of shamanism that you practice? Well, I don't ever call myself a shaman. I think I referred to my soul as having been a shaman in many lifetimes. Mm-hmm. Um, what's interesting is I studied many healing modalities. And every time I studied one, I thought it was very limiting. And then when I really started to study shamanism, I realized, oh, well, that's how I would do it if I had the choice. 
Mm-hmm. You know, um, I don't have any specific. I've studied a few um, Peruvian, Costa Rican. Um, I've studied with Jana Ingle Smith at Light Song, um, Grandmother Flor de Mayo, uh, a Mayan elder. And um, I had a very good friend who's now passed away that was an elder in the in Wyoming at the Shoshone Rin, Wind River Tribe. Mm-hmm. And his name was Bavado, um, Rainbow Thunderheart. And I was friends with him and traveled with him quite a bit. And um, when he had cancer at the end of his life and was actually dying, he came to live with my husband and I for, for a little bit. And I was able to spend quite a bit of quality time with him. And his work was more based in earth keeping. And so I had a very well grounded education in earth keeping and earth ceremonies, medicine wheel ceremonies. But I don't really gravitate to that personally, I gravitate toward healing the fractured soul, healing soul imprints, what the psychiatrist would refer to as wounded inner children, Mm -hmm. what the uh, shaman referred to as soul loss. Mm -hmm. And so when someone refers to themselves as having uh, shamanic abilities, what that basically means is in a nutshell, I'm willing to listen and hear things I've never heard before even if it challenges my belief system with the faith and knowing that it's being shown to me because I'm able to facilitate a resolution. Hmm. So um, I don't know if um, you've studied any shamanism at all, but generally speaking, I think it's okay to say that a shaman has three tools. The first being gratitude so living a life of reverence and, and in, intention with gratitude. Number two, the second tool would be tr- uh, trust, mm-hmm. truth and trust, knowing that the truth is going to be revealed to you and trusting that you will understand and know what to do with that truth when, when it is brought forward. And in order to perceive the truth, it's not my truth fits into a box of a certain protocol or a certain belief system. It's it's what is the universal truth, right? Mm. And then the third tool being uh, self-awareness with discipline. Mm. So to be uh, to be considered someone who works with shamanic principles or practices, one must have by definition gone on a personal healing journey and become very self-aware and utilize discipline, tremendous discipline in managing one's own energy and being able to go through that process, experience that healing journey um, I'm sure you've heard of Joseph Campbell and the the hero's journey. Yeah, I love that. In that, in 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 that mythos, right? Every time the hero goes on a journey or one evolution around that circle, every time we heal certain aspects of ourselves, that becomes our medicine for the next journey. So the way a shaman. Uh, gathers his or her medicine is on his own healing journey. And back in the day, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that's where the term wounded healer came from. Now, metaphysics has twisted that term a little bit from my perspective, mm-hmm. but the, the wounding would have been for a shaman, an event, traumatic or psychological event that woke the shaman up to a remembering that we are divine and we have these energies and we can perceive multidimensionally. Um, we can perceive beyond the physical form. And then from that awakening, that wounding, the shaman would then go on a healing journey and pass through some ritualistic ceremony, et cetera. And oftentimes uh, those types of ceremonies would be overseen by women or priestesses or, or wise women. And it would involve some type of, 
like an ayahuasca or mm -hmm. other plant medicine type of a journey, or it would be, uh, you know, going into the wilderness for, for three weeks or going into a cave without anything to eat for, you know, a week or something like that, to the point where you would, you can often have an out of body experience. And it usually happens at the 11th hour and mm -hmm. all of those beautiful stories that you read. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think you live in Arizona. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, do you yeah. get in any do you get involved with any of the Navajo tribes out there? I don't. I actually have friends on the Navajo reservation in New Mexico, mm -hmm. but I don't do much work. I've gone to some talks and listened mm -hmm. to, for example, a Hopi elder speak, and mm -hmm. I've attended some ceremonies, but I, I do not work with the indigenous people mm -hmm. directly. Yeah. Other than training from those who have been trained by them. It reminded me of, it sidetracked me, but for people who've never been to Arizona or New Mexico, first of all, it's just an amazing place. I was driving with some friends through New Mexico to some back way to get to Phoenix. And we were going through, I think, Indian reservations and small towns. But we were in the car and we turned on the radio. We were all into talk radio. So we were scrolling through talk radio and I was so shocked to see that it was like a Native American radio station. Like we popped onto some radio station and it was like chanting, like that was on the radio. Ah, 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 ah. You know, I was like, oh, wow. I, I didn't even know they had this. Have you ever heard any of that? While living oh, there? yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you would have most likely been on the Hopi Reservation in Northeast Arizona. Probably somewhere around there. Yeah, I think that you're mm -hmm. right. Yeah, because I think mm -hmm. we came in from 40 and kind of went diagonal, probably close to that place, the Petrified Forest. Is that near the Hobi Reservation? Mm -hmm. Well, there's um, then further south, there's mm -hmm. the Navajo and also Apache that I'm aware. I think there's another one that I live in the area of the Yavapai, the four, the four corners, the four mountains of mm -hmm. the Yavapai in mm -hmm. a valley is mm -hmm. near a, a mountain called Granite Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm much further west. So you would have been closer to the Apache and Navajo. I, I think so. Yeah. You know, Up in not, the mountains. Yeah, it was on the mountains. I remember we were looking at, was we were driving, yeah. it was like looking at cliffs and stuff. And um, it was like, mm -hmm. it was right around 2000, so it's 20 years ago. But it's a really interesting thing to, you know, to see a Native American radio station. Absolutely. Is your main focus in healing with animals or with people? I can't answer that question. I I thought my main focus would always be people. Oh. And then the animals started coming in to my sessions with people. And I would say, well, I'm seeing a white cat in your energy field. And, you know, this particular man said, I don't have a cat. And I said, well, there's a very angry white cat in your energy field right mm -hmm. now. And he, we're not going to move forward until you talk to him. And he said, oh, that's my wife's cat that lived with us when we um, were engaged or something. And I said, well, you didn't like this cat at all because this cat does not like you. <laughs> wow. You know, and so other animals would come. I would say, do you have a dog? Do you have a horse? Do you have a white horse? Do you have a black horse? You know, if the animals have wings, that meant they passed over. If they looked very solid, that meant they were still alive. And they would come and bring messages. And for a while, I was pretty disturbed by this. I said, you know, why the heck are these animals coming into my human healing sessions? And finally, I got a visitation in a meditation that said, hey, we're the ones that were guiding you on your healing journey to overcome your trauma. Mm. And now we are asking you to help translate healing in the way that it worked for you to animals because far too many healers and animal advocates don't believe that animals can be traumatized, don't believe animals can hold a grudge, don't believe animals can take on the illnesses of their owners. And we need someone to help be an advocate for us because many of us in, in domestication mm -hmm. are very, very traumatized. So I said, Oh, okay, well, I'll think about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then just naturally, I got more and more clients who were animal clients. And then um, in 2017, I had a really profound experience where I was trying to rescue a traumatized horse. Mm. And 
through a series of unfortunate events, the horse had an accident and died. And I was very moved by that. And I decided that I would dedicate a year of my life to supporting traumatized horses and that I, I was going to travel across the country and visit horse rescues and try to help as many traumatized horses as I could. And in doing that, I became quite well known and uh, my career really took off. Wow. Yeah. In my research of you in your second NDE, from what I understand, you decided to come back because of some horses and donkeys. And for some reason, it was in my mind that you kind of were leaned more to helping horses and donkeys from perhaps from that incident. But I guess that's not exactly right then. Well, I had been a horse person. I had mm -hmm. horses. And mm -hmm. prior to my NDE, when I was very sick, um, the only thing I ever did to get out of bed for was to go volunteer at a nearby sanctuary when I could no longer ride or train my own horses on the ground because I was on fentanyl and it was mm -hmm. very dangerous. Mm -hmm. I went to volunteer at an animal sanctuary that had 70 burros, 70 donkeys, standard and mini donkeys, mm -hmm. and about 30 or 40 horses. And I think it was in that process of spending many, many days a week just walking around in the herd um, where my soul somehow agreed to this path, but I did not remember it. And in my NDE, um, I was prepared at 20, in 2012, I was prepared to leave. I, the only thing I thought was who would take care of my husband, which was a very ironic thing to think when <laughs> I was bedridden and my husband was taking care of me, you know. But I was prepared to leave because I really had had enough suffering in this life, mm. you know, 10 years ago. And um, and as I was about to put my hand in Jesus's hand and walk away, I heard some noise behind me and I turned around and there were the horses and donkeys from the sanctuary. So you're actually correct. Mm. But when I came back, that event wasn't foremost in my mind. I needed to get off of drugs, off of fentanyl, off of Dilaudid, off of, um, I needed to get out of bed. I needed to heal myself. I needed to get out of the victim mentality. I needed to heal from trauma and all of these other conditions, you know, that I had been diagnosed with. And on that journey, I became so self-absorbed that I completely forgot about the animals. Oh, okay. That's interesting. I don't know much about the show, The Horse Whisperer. I don't. I almost. I basically know nothing. It's just the title, and you know. But it sounds like to me you could be the real horse whisperer. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of very well-known animal communicators in the United States and mm -hmm. thousands across the world, and and many who have been doing it for decades longer than me, and they've mm -hmm. made television shows about them, and you know, they've talked to thousands and thousands and thousands of animals. Um, I would say I could be among them. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I do things a little bit differently than traditional animal communicators because I can see energy and I can see the energetic patterns and I can see the energy blocks and I can see the trauma in the amygdala and the nervous system. And I can talk to the soul as well as the unconscious patterns and work from a distance uh, doing energy work. Mm -hmm. it, I'm a little bit different, a little more unique, I would say. And because of that, I'm actually quite effective in working with traumatized animals. Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of my clients have rescued or traumatized animals. Mm -hmm. I just kind of thought that with your background of having the NDE, you would have, you know, so you've had like a spiritually transformative experience where you've gained abilities probably more than the average person who communicates with animals. Mm. Well, you know, everybody has unique abilities. And I would say I do, I do have a unique combination of abilities that is probably rare, but not unheard of. Mm -hmm. And, and it doesn't discount or in any way negate other people's abilities, even if they're not exactly like mine. Mm -hmm. For example, I do not claim to be a medical medium. 
Okay. You know, I cannot tell you, I cannot diagnose. And some people who have never had an NDE can tell you exactly the medical condition, mm. exactly what is going on with the health of the animal. Mm. And for me, my agreement with the universe is in order to really honor the animal, I have agreed that I will never know anything that the higher self does not want me to know. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I might talk to an animal today who's going to pass away in seven days, but I wasn't allowed to know that mm -hmm. because the, the animal chose that journey and it would have interfered with the owner and the animal to know that. Mm -hmm. um, some animal communicators do use their Claire, what is it, Claire um, voyance, which is being able to see. And um, they use their clairvoyance and they go into the memories of the animal and they look at pictures and they then interpret through their own human experience what the pictures mean in their memories. Mm -hmm. So some people are also able to say um, exactly what happened to the to the animal, the dog, the cat, the horse, you know, the first 15 years of its life before it showed up at a rescue. And I don't work like that. I don't go into the memories of an animal and pull out whatever data you wish to know as, as an owner. I ask the animal a question and they have the option to answer it in as much detail or little detail as they want. So I work a little bit differently, um, but I think it's quite effective. Mm -hmm. Which do you get more pleasure from, working with animals or humans? <laughs> I I don't think I can choose. I had a uh, my passion. I, I, I was going to say I had a feeling you were going to say that, but I, <laughs> I had to ask. Well, uh, I think that my passion, my true, true passion, the passion of my soul is to help people feel validated and seen and heard. And to help people be able, if they want to understand what are their unique gifts and abilities and to see their deepest compassion and, and, and how hard they try and, and what their intention is. And that's my higher selves purpose is to help other people feel and be empowered I, I had so many experiences when I was a healer where I was disempowered by someone else telling me that for $500 or $1,000 or $5,000, they could heal me, when in fact, that's just not the case. So my greatest passion, it, and it is from a human perspective, right, is to say, you know, Jeff, your superpower is, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And I love to do that by giving animal uh, messages from animals to children. And mm. uh, I w I'll, if I could share a quick story with you. Sure, yeah. Um, I was talking with a girlfriend on the phone and she had me on speakerphone in her car, but I thought it was just us and we were chatting. And then all of a sudden my donkey came in and said it wanted to, and I happened to know her and her grandchildren and it said it wanted to talk to one of her granddaughters. And I said, my donkey wants to talk to your granddaughter I don't know why my donkey's coming now. And she goes, Oh, my granddaughter's in the car. Oh, wow. And I said, Oh, okay. And so we asked permission for the granddaughter to receive a message from the donkey. And uh, she said, Yes. And my donkey said, Your superpower is kindness and compassion. And the, the young woman, was started just squealing and screeching. And I'm like, what, what happened? What's going on? And she, and she was just graduating from high school that week. Mm -hmm. And she goes, that's what all my friends wrote in my high school yearbook that I'm so kind and compassionate. Mm -hmm. Well, little did I know they were on their way driving to a Chinese restaurant and the fortune cookie the young woman got said, your best quality is that you are compassionate. Oh, wow. And they sent me a picture of the fortune cookie. So it's that kind of, you know, letting people know that they are good people, mm -hmm. you know, and that they are seen and they are heard and that their loving intentions toward people don't go unnoticed. However, I have to say, I love 
helping people understand that their animals are spiritually gifted. Mm -hmm. Their animals are spiritually gifted. Mm -hmm. I went to a ranch recently and as I was leaving, uh, the horse turned, said, wanted to say goodbye. So I stopped and I turned and I said, oh, your horse wants to say goodbye to me. And he said, your horses are very beautiful. And I said, horses? What, what do you mean horses? My horses are beautiful. And he said, the ones you brought with you today. And I started crying because in the past year and a half or two years, I had just lost five animals, five horses mm. that had been euthanized or had died for whatever reason. Right. So they were all around me and he saw them. So helping people to know and understand that their animals can see the non-physical or that they can telepathically communicate or they know what's going on and give the animal a voice. It's also a passion. But I have to say that people are so stressed out and so depressed and so disempowered often. And <clears throat> many of us have just been so dishonored that the, the highest excitement for me is to really help a person feel honored who previously had not felt that way. What do you mean by feeling <clears throat> honored? It's feeling seen, be, oh. feeling heard that, oh, you see me. You know, some, you know, sometimes people ha have quite remarkable spirit and gift. I mean, we all have remarkable spirit, but some people are just extraordinarily special, caring, mm -hmm. dedicated people. And it just goes unnoticed right. for whatever reason, whether they're humble or they're not around a lot of people, or they're in an unfortunate situation where there's a lot of trauma or stress in the home, mm -hmm. you know, <clears throat> so for some people to hear that, to be validated is quite valuable and it changes their life. Right. All right. Do you have any projects that you're working on right now that we should know about? I am putting together a year long project with a friend to help people um, heal themselves. So it will be, it will be a weekly uh, process and we'll have monthly lectures and homework and sharing all of the different healing modalities that I learned to heal. Um, so we're putting that together and that should be ready around April or May next year. And I'm also writing a book with a friend who's a chiropractor oh, in right. England oh, awesome. um, who practices Chinese medicine and applied kinesiology. And he was a client. And then we found out that our healing journeys really closely resembled one another. And he had majored in comparative religion in school and so has a tremendous academic background and different mm -hmm. spiritual philosophies. And he minored in philosophy as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so we decided to put our experiences together and write a book about the efficacy of healing trauma through alternative healing. So we're really excited about that as well. Oh, that's cool. Um, are you a public person or a private person? And if you are a public, do you like engage with people on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that? Well, I think... I wish that I wasn't a public person, <laughs> but because, you know, my desire is to help as many people and animals as I can, that I have no choice but to keep my name out there and to continue to, to try to maintain some relevancy. Um, so I do have a Facebook page, but I don't do Twitter. I don't do TikTok. I don't do Instagram. I have a website and a Facebook page and, and that's the, the limit there. I don't have a secretary, so it can really be burdensome getting a number of emails every day and having to answer people and still try to keep some balanced lifestyle, you know? Right. What is your website? It's heart of the horse dot us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Heart of the horse dot us. All right. And on your website, is that more about what you do for horses? Well, I'd say it's horse heavy. It's animal heavy, but mm -hmm. there, there are human services. There's a page for human services and a page for animal services, but then there are four or five resource pages, including NDEs and, um, 
There are resources for holistic animal care, holistic veterinary care, mm. energy healing for people, energy and alternative body type work for animals. Um, I've got a, a lot of information about myself and my training. And um, there are probably by now 25 or so videos or interviews that I've done. There's also a lot of information about the opioid crisis, which I'm very passionate about since mm -hmm. that my my last NDE, which we didn't speak about, which is just fine. Mm -hmm. um, but that was caused by a fentanyl overdose where mm -hmm. my brain forgot to tell my lungs to breathe. Yeah. Right. And so I'm very passionate about helping people understand that a lot of the pain that we experience, what manifests as physical pain is trapped energy in our body. Um, but because that is probably not the first thing that is going to be promoted following, you know, some sort of narcotic control, I'm, I'm supporting osteopathic, homeopathic, and chiropractic medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I speak out. I've been the keynote speaker at two annual chiropractic conferences. I've, um, I, I basically will talk to anybody that will listen to me, quite frankly, mm -hmm. about the, the merits of, for example, chiropractic medicine and the good that that does. And um, I absolutely believe in it. So thank you so much for doing what you do in that regard. And I do like to promote alternative medicine, such as Chinese medicine and Reiki is now considered, which is energy healing is now considered a complementary medicine. Mm -hmm. Alternative is where it is an alternative to allopathic medicine, mm -hmm. where you um, substitute allopathic medicine for alternative medicine. Complementary medicine is when you use an alternative such as Reiki or um, Bowen work mm. or some other type of uh, laser treatment, et cetera, mm. in addition to allopathic medicine. So the National Institute of Health has actually come out with that ruling some time ago. And so I'm very passionate about supporting alternative healing methods and complementary healing methods. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I always kind of registered in my brain as they called it CAM, and it was like complementary alternative medicine. I think they just combined them both mm -hmm. together. I, mm -hmm. never really had them I had not heard that term. Yeah, I never had it had it separated before, but does it really matter as long as it helps the person? That's all that matters. Right. Well, some people care. Yeah. <laughs> the people that are married to science really, really care about yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, so true. I try to stay in my lane, you know. Right. You know, I hardly ever talk about me being a chiropractor on my podcast, and probably most people don't even know it. But I was going to mention that I took a class one time in adjusting horses, and it was from a famous guy, and I'm here in Texas, so it's, you know, common to see horses. And uh, it was from a famous guy that used to treat racehorses. But one of the things was I was just, you know, they're such huge animals compared to working on humans. And one time a horse just kind mm -hmm. of moved, casually moved his leg, but moved it on top of my foot. And I was like, ah, and I was pulling my foot out because it's heavy. <laughs> But I think they can get amazing results and people in that circle see a lot of benefit from them. Absolutely. Yeah. Before we wrap it up here, is there one last message that you can give us? Wow. I would just say right now it is, what is it? December 23rd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Happy holidays to yeah. everyone. But beyond that, please be kind to yourselves because this is a very stressful time for everyone right now. And um, the world just needs a lot more love. And that's the message that I was given probably thousands of times. Forgiveness is the key. Love is the answer. And let me tell you right now, it's the only answer that's going to be effective. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great message. I agree with you. All right, Jenny, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you. I'd like to have you back because I know we can talk about so much more. And if I don't have you back before, then let's definitely get you back when you finish that book. Sure, absolutely. All right, well, thanks and uh, happy holidays and have a great evening. All righty, bye-bye. Bye-bye.